morning. As we begin uh, the second part of our service this morning, like we've done each of the past weeks, uh, we have a special treat for you to help inspire us and continue our worship as we think about uh, the coming Christmas season. And so I would tell you to sit back and relax, but I think this morning you're actually going to want to sit up and maybe tap your toes. So I think you'll recognize this one as the CF Youth Band uh, leads us. So...
<laughs> Thanks, you guys. I think next service I'm going to have to get them to get me a tambourine because it is hard to sit still, isn't it, while they're playing? <laughs> I love the words uh, to this song, actually, so I'm going to read them again just to remind us. It says, little baby, I am a poor boy too. I have no gift to bring that's fit to give our king, so can I play for you? Pa-rumpa-pum-pum, rumpa-pum-pum, rumpa-pum-pum. Now, these lyrics, they do something fun because they draw us into the story. They help us consider what it would be to have been someone that was there that night. And what would we have wanted to bring our king? The little drummer boy had nothing he thought to bring. Nothing worthy of the Savior that he was visiting except to play. Yet we know that his gift was the highest form of worship that he could offer because he used something that God had given him, and out of gratitude, he gave it back. He offered it to Jesus in worship. And this is much like we are going to see in the the song of Mary, the story of Mary this morning, because the little boy claimed his identity as a child of the king. He knew who he was when he came. And he submitted what he had, his destiny, his gifts, his future, in worship to the king. And like him, as we sit in this season that we've been talking about, the season of Advent, the season of waiting, while we anticipate the coming of Jesus in just a few weeks, we sit in this same place. What can we bring? So our story this morning, or our song, since we're in the series Christmas Finals, our song this morning is the song of Mary. And it comes from Luke chapter 1. Now this is what we know about Mary. Mary was a young, proper Jewish girl on the verge of pretty much an unremarkable but potentially joyful life as the wife of Joseph, who deeply loved her. Mary was not a woman of privilege. In fact, she was part of a a disrespected community within a suppressed and suffering nation. I'll explain that a little bit. You see, Nazareth, Mary's hometown, was a settlement of only about 200 people, and it sat about an hour's walk from the district capital of Galilee. Most of us have heard of Galilee. Now, the Galileans in that town had a particular disdain for the Nazarenes. It had something to do with the past, and they looked down on them. So besides being from this disrespected community where she was looked down on, she was also living under oppression under Roman rule. So she carried these realities with her daily as she went about her life as well as the stigma that we're going to learn about of now becoming an unwed teenage mother. So by the standards of the world around her, anybody that would have looked on Mary's life, looked at her, would have thought that she was pretty much unremarkable, despised even, pretty much destined to lead an insignificant life. And when they looked at her, that is what the world saw. Thankfully, that is not what God saw, and that is not what Mary herself saw. Because we know that Mary was also a believer, and she was a worshiper of the one true God. She was a young woman of deep and genuine faith. And Esau McCauley, an author and pastor, is going to share the significance of these facts about Mary to give us a different perspective of how we see her today. He says this, Joseph and Mary grew up in the shadow of the empire, the Roman Empire, with the reminder of Rome's domination just a short jaunt down the road in Galilee. Whatever dreams that Mary nursed in her teenage heart about her future were forever changed by the angel Gabriel. He let her know that she would not simply be a witness to what God might do in the world. So she wasn't just going to observe 
or see it. She would be a participant in it. Let's stop a second as we read this last phrase. She would be the location of the tabernacle of God as the Spirit of God knit together the hope of the world in her womb. I just want us to think about that for a minute as we think about this season. That at this time in Mary's story, before leading up to the birth of Christ, she was the location of the tabernacle of God as the Spirit of God was knitting together Jesus, the hope of the world, in her womb. So Mary's significance is birthed in this story. Her significance is birthed, as we're going to see, when she claims her identity in God and submits her destiny to his work. So let's read this story together and see how this plays out. So we're in Luke chapter 1. If you've got your Bible with us or if you've got an app on your phone, you can open it with me. For those of you that might be uh, newer to Jesus or newer to the faith, we've got the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then Luke is that third book in the New Testament. So if you can flip there with me, Luke chapter 1, we read this. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But as you can imagine, if an angel had just appeared to you, she was a little troubled, don't you think? So the scripture says she was greatly troubled at the saying, and she was trying to discern what kind of greeting this might be. <laughs> what was this angel telling her? And so the angel assures her, and this is what he said. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. So this is the message that she's given, and her response to the angel is simply this. How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary says, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, there's a few things that I want us to look at in these verses, and particularly in Mary's response to the angel and to God when she's given this assignment. So in her first response, she asks the question, how will this be since I am a virgin? Well, we know from a couple weeks ago uh, when Michael talked on Zechariah that Zechariah also asked a question. But Mary is asking a different question of Gabriel in this instance. So in contrast to Zechariah, who was asking God more for proof, like, show me God, are you really going to do this? Mary is being inquisitive, and she's simply asking God for an explanation. How will it be? How is this going to happen? It's a spiritual clarifying question, a moment of curiosity. 
So she's not questioning if God is going to do this. She's simply asking him, how? How are you going to do this? And so God answers her. And then we see her response. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be me according to your word. Now, this is a very simple response, a very simple structure for a prayer that Mary is praying back. There's just one noun and there's just one verb. The noun identifies Mary, the word servant, and the verb is pulling her into God's action. So again, in this phrase, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be me according to your word. We see her claim her identity and we see her submit to her destiny. The noun is hand, handmaiden. In some versions, you may have handmaiden or slave or in the ESV, servant. She is praying herself into the deepest identity that she can, which is as a servant of the Lord. And I love this thought that servant is her prayed identity. Lord, make me a servant of yours. By means of the verb, Mary is praying God's action into her life. So she's saying, let it be me according to your word. Is not anything that Mary is going to do on her own, and she knows that. God will do it in Mary, and God will do it through Mary. And it's that to which she is submitting. She embraces the action of God in her response. So in this simple prayer, this simple phrase, this simple response, Mary is doing two things. She is claiming her identity and she is submitting her destiny. I'm going to explain that a little bit because this is the core of what I believe God's message is for us this morning. Mary's response continues in still Luke chapter 1, but verse 46 through 55. And this is in the story that Steve shared so beautifully last week. So if you remember, in this part of the story, Mary, so Gabriel has appeared to Mary, and she is going to visit Elizabeth, her relative who was barren, who is now carrying um, John the Baptist. And so we know upon her arrival that the baby John leaps in Elizabeth's womb. And in joyful exuberance of this act of seeing Elizabeth, of seeing God at work and the baby leaping in Elizabeth's womb, Mary has another response. And she responds with these words, these opening words that have been known throughout centuries as the Magnificat. So let's look at these. Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 49. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, now all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. So she begins, my soul magnifies the Lord. Her head and her heart are turned upward to God. And in worship, Mary again identifies herself as God's servant. She says he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. Again, she sees this word servant as her primary identity. Then, in the next phrase, she again reveals her destiny. All generations will call me blessed. But why? Again, is it because something that Elizabeth is going to do or something that she has done? No. We know it's because of what God is doing in her and will continue to do through her. It's because she said yes to God. 
and yes to his destiny for her. So in these opening verses, though she is not only submitting to her personal destiny, but she is also submitting to the destiny of God's entire story. And all of the story of his people throughout time. For her words are taken and recast from the prayer of Hannah. The prayer of Hannah can be found in the Old Testament, and it was prayed when she, which was over a thousand years earlier, Hannah was an ancestor of Mary's, and it was prayed when Hannah was pregnant with Samuel. Hannah's song, similar to Mary's, begins, My heart exalts in the Lord, and my strength is exalted in God. You see the similarity? My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. You see, Mary knows her family story. She knows her scriptures. And she knows how God has been working and speaking among his people for the last 2,000 years. So in placing these words on the lips of Mary, what Luke is letting us know in this passage is that the story that he is about to tell us is the culmination of the history of Israel. And that this culmination is a great reveal in that the lowly are made high and the high are made low. Again, in her response to Gabriel's message, Mary is both claiming her identity and submitting her destiny. Now, another interesting parallel to Mary's response can actually be found in Christ's response. These prayers are very similar to the prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before his death. So if we fast, or not fast forward, but if we flip it through pages forward to Luke chapter 22, here's where we hear Jesus. It says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Here, as Jesus is about to fulfill the hardest assignment that God has given him, He is claiming his identity as God's son. We can also wonder if part of the word of this prayer came even from Mary as she would have taught him how to pray growing up. And he would have heard the story of her response to God. So in this prayer, Jesus begins by addressing his father. He knows where he comes from, and he knows what God can make possible. Yet in claiming his identity, he also submits his destiny, because even though he knows what God can do, he says, not my will, but yours be done. Eugene Peterson puts it really nicely when he says this. Day by day and week by week, Month by month, as Jesus' identity as God among us, so as Jesus lived as God among us, every day as it was filled out detail by detail, he prayed each detail into the form of a servant. His daily persistent praying kept every notice and recognition that came his way, every gesture he made expressive and revelatory of God and God's salvation. So everything that was put upon him, he reflected back to God. Every gesture he made, everything he said, was as a servant of his Father. You see, Jesus flipped the entire power structure. He became great 
by taking on the identity of a servant. Now, what's interesting here is that Jesus and Mary both had revelations from God, right? They had assignments from God that were clearly given to them. And revelation can be a very hard gift to receive. Yet both Mary and Jesus gave up everything to receive it. They accepted the cost of the revelation and found themselves in the deepest of stories. Stories that we're still telling thousands of years later in our churches even this morning. If Mary and Jesus were here today, what would they tell us about our role in God's story? What do you think they would say? I think that they would say that our significance, our place in history, is also birthed when we claim our identity and we submit our destiny to God's purposes. Scott Erickson, who is a spiritual director and pastor, says it this way. He says, all great stories come at a cost. And the cost of revelation, it's that it's going to ask something of us. You guys know that? (laughs) Yeah, when God gives us something, it costs something of us. In any divine annunciation, you receive revelation as a gift. And yet, at the same time, you receive notice that everything you had planned is ending. (laughs) Isn't that true? It's all over. Everything will change. Most of all, you. Mary's life changed when she accepted God's revelation. And Jesus' life changed when he accepted God's revelation. So the question for us, and it's a big question, church, is are you ready to change? Are you ready to change? As we sit in this season of waiting for the coming of the Messiah, I believe God is saying to us this morning, will we claim our identity and will we set aside our plans for our destiny to let God fold us in to his purposes, to bring us in to his story. You see, our transformation throughout our life is kind of a paradox because there's this one truth that we can make decisions and we can change part of our lives, right? I mean, if I decided next week to eat nothing but French fries and chocolate milkshakes, something would happen, right? I'd probably have a transformation in my abdomen. Would not be good. Likewise, we can make decisions to live out of gratitude and thankfulness and and choose to see God and joy in the things around us. We have choices. We have some choices in our transformation and in our destiny. But yet there are other parts of our transformation and our destiny that are like this virgin birth in the way that we are not in charge of any of it. It's less about mustering up our strength to accomplish something and more about being open to the transformation that God wants to do inside of us. It begins quietly and deeply within us, a divine inception in the deepest places where our truest identity our truest life is birthed. This is a season of birthing. Scott Erickson again puts it this way. He says, this is the place where the divine begins new life. 
and newness of life is what we all desire. Now, I'll be honest and say we may not realize it because this is not a surface-level discussion. This is a soul-level discussion. But at our soul level, newness is what we all desire. It is the work of the Spirit that the Spirit began in Mary, and this is the work of the Spirit He's wanting to do in the soul womb of all humanity. To bring Christ's participation into fullness within you, within me. To bring us in the fullness of the participatory life of Christ. Most of us will not have an angel announce God's plan to us, but I do think all of us can whisper that the statement, the statement that the divine is looking for to do deep transformation and restoration in us. We can say, let it be me according to your word. Now, sometimes, like with Mary and Jesus, when God wants to bring us into his participatory life, it can be painful, and it can be confusing, and it can be a lot of different emotions. So I want to tell you a little story to kind of help glue all of this together to give you something tangible to attach these truths to. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my story. And one of the first things I would want you guys to know is that I have lived a pretty privileged life. So if I look back on my life, there is not much that I waited for or wanted for. In fact, as I was pondering it a little bit, a funny memory came to mind because the only thing I could think of remotely close uh, when I was about 13 and I desperately wanted a boyfriend because all my friends had boyfriends. Anybody remember that season or half teenagers? <laughs> and it felt like forever. But other than that instance, I couldn't think, really think of something until about nine years ago. And so my first real painful waiting experience, an experience where I was doubting, waiting to see if God would show up for me, came then. And it came when I realized that I had my destiny in a lot of ways wrapped up in my role or my vocation. Now, for some of you, um, that may be the case. Uh, you may see yourself, it may be that some of your identity is in what you do or where you work, or it may be your role as a mom or a dad or as a wife or a husband. It could be in any number of things where we tend to put our identity. Mine just happened to be my vocation. And so I knew um, that my vocation was part of God's calling for me, but I also had a vision for what that would look like lived out. So while God had just revealed a part of it to me, I had kind of played it all the way out in my mind into what my future would look like and assumed that it was God's vision for me as well. And so much so, since it was wrapped up in my job, uh, which happened to be uh, for a church, when I came to a point where it looked like I was going to need to leave that job, um, my destiny was in crisis, so to speak, because I thought that that also meant I would be leaving my friends, my family, and my church family that I'd been part of for a long time. And I have shared parts of that part of the story before. But things were attached to my role, and I was struggling to trust that I would have significance and be able to fulfill my calling without that role. Now, Thankfully, uh, God intervened in that thought pattern, and it came about in the context of a Beth Moore class that I was taking. It was a class called Sacred Secrets, and to help you guys understand the context, I need to tell you a little bit about the class, but the idea behind Sacred Secrets uh, is that what Beth Moore was saying is that there are two kinds of secrets uh, in life. There are the good kinds of secrets, and there are dangerous kinds of secrets. 
Now, dangerous kinds of secrets are those that involve our sin patterns. They can involve our obsessions and addictions and compulsions. They're things that we want to hide because we don't want other people to know about them. We are ashamed. Um, and so we keep it a secret. So those are dangerous kinds of secrets. And then there are the good kinds of secrets. And those are the secrets like the angel Gabriel brought to Mary. It's a secret that God whispers to us when he's revealing that revelation. When he has a word for us or maybe an assignment or a calling and he shares that with us. That is a sacred secret. Now, the interesting thing about both of these kinds of secrets is that they have something in common, and that is that secrets manifest. Secrets always manifest. And so what that means is that they're going to come out. And so if it's a dangerous kind of secret, we know that truth always comes to light because God will never leave sin in the dark. We just don't know when it's going to come out. And as is the case with good secrets, God is faithful to keep his promises. And those secrets will also manifest. And they will come out, just not necessarily according to our timetable. So this is the context with which um, I feel like I got a message from God about what I was struggling with and my significance. Now, an angel did not appear to me. It was not anything that big or that grand. But as I was sitting in class one day, we were looking at the Old Testament, and it was a verse about rooftops. And I can't remember exactly which verse it was. I have looked. Um, but God just whispered in my ear. He said, Beth, he said, I have another rooftop for you but I can't take you there until you get off this one. <laughs> Which is kind of a strange you know, thing to say, except I knew exactly what he meant. And that was, I was holding back what God had for me. He was not holding it back. And so I had to make the decision to get off the rooftop and trust whatever it was that he had next for me. And so in that instance, I did, which meant leaving my job. And eventually it meant needing to find a new church home, which a little less than two years later led my husband Chris and I here to Christian Fellowship. And I found myself in another Beth Moore study. This one led by Sue Ann Moore. So lots of Beths, lots of Moores. But Sue Ann Moore, who's been a teacher here um, for a long time, and it was a study called Entrusted. And the easiest way I think that I can explain my shift or my change in perspective is to read the verse that kind of changed it all for me. It's a verse from 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 12. And we're going to put it on the screen. I'm also going to commentate a little bit through it because it's one I had read before, but it had always been confusing to me. And I wasn't sure what God was saying. And in this season, he clarified it for me. But it says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. So we're going to pause there. God has saved us and he has called each of us to a holy calling. We each have one. This verse was a reminder of that to me. We each have one. And it's not because of our works. It's not because of anything we have done, but because of God's own purpose and grace that he gives us these callings. It's his purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Now, I want you to think about this. God knew you would be here. And he knew what assignment or assignments he would have for you before the ages began. I mean, do you believe that? It's so hard for us to forget when we get wrapped up in our own perspective. 
but God knows. So before the ages began, which now has been manifested, it is now coming true. The promise is now happening, and it is because of the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ came so we could fulfill our purposes. And then this powerful line, but I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. I know in whom I have believed and I am convinced or I am persuaded that he is able to protect that. What I have entrusted to him until that day, he is able He knew he was going to give it to to us, to me. But he's holding it. He's guarding it. He's protecting it until that day. Whatever that day may be. Because only he knows. Every time I start doubting, I just think back to this verse. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted unto him until that day. So Mary's significance was birthed in a very similar situation when she claimed her identity as a servant and said to God, Let it be me, according to your word. And she submitted her destiny. Our significance is birthed when we as well claim our identity and submit our destiny. So we're going to pause for just a minute. Because as we sit in this season of waiting, this Advent season, I have two questions I want you to ponder. The first one is this. Where are you anxiously waiting? Where is that anxiety maybe in your soul today? And you're doubting that God will show up. And you're believing you're insignificant in some way. Is there a place? trust that God is going to speak that to you if there is and where is God inviting you to claim your identity or to reclaim it if that's you this morning submit your destiny or resubmit your destiny and step into the significance that he has for this next season of your life where is he extending you an invitation Where is God waiting to hear from you? Let it be me according to your word.